good to see uh, familiar faces, to see friends of the African Leadership Centre, and of course uh, new faces uh, as well. Uh, I would like to do two things, but before I do that, let me introduce uh, myself briefly. My name is Fumi Kolonishani. I'm the founding director of the African Leadership Centre. Uh, last year, June, I handed over to a new director who's based in Nairobi and who manages the centre. I, I ran the centre from its founding in 2010 June to June 2014, both in London and Nairobi. My day job now uh, is still at the African Leadership Centre at King's College of London. I direct the academic programme of security, leadership and society. Uh, I must say I'm doing this uh, Godwin Moronga, current director of the centre, should be standing there doing this introduction. But he's also running another program at this moment in uh, It's a pleasure to be doing this on his behalf and not on my own behalf, as a matter of fact. Uh, but the, the two things I would like to do first is to talk about the African Leadership Centre and a particular friendship program. Um, and second will be about the core business of today, which is around simulation before I then introduce the panel that is to come out. The, the African Leadership Center, uh, I'd like to see as a, a unique sort of program. We founded the center for a whole range of reasons, but at the core of it was to fill critical gaps. Knowledge gaps on the African continent, leadership gaps as well. So our vision is to create really uh, a next generation, a new generation of Africa who are scholars and analysts and generating knowledge for what we'd like to see as transformative uh, change that could deal with peace, security, and development in Africa. But you know, we did this for a whole range of reasons. And four years after the actual founding, even though we started this program 10 years ago, the program, our fellows uh, have been coming to Kate for the last 10 years. At the time, it seemed like a really novel idea, and in many ways it still is. But today you find all sorts of leadership programs, leadership centers, and it leads me to really try to answer what was the question in your mind, which is what is different about you? What sets the African Leadership Center? Or what sets our fellowship program apart from other programs? And in that respect, actually, I want to address three things. One is that this fellowships were created for a transformative agenda. And that transformative agenda, the heart of it, is a whole issue of the core values. The core values of the African Leadership Center that we attach to really solid academic training sets us apart. We know that the leadership gaps that we talk about in the African continent are there, despite the fact that we have many African heads of states, uh, ministers, advisors who were trained in Oxford, Cambridge, you know, various uh, solid academic and military institutions globally. So we don't rely on academic excellence alone. The core values that our fellows already bring evidence of uh, with them to the center, but which we still at the center separates them uh, completely from any other program. But that transformative agenda that is attached to all of this, which is truly to transform the discourses around peace, security, and development in Africa uh, in a way that the continent can stand up firmly uh, and be able to deal with the 21st century challenges, sets us apart, and we do it not just academically, but practically. Now, what, what do I want to say uh, about our fellows? I think our fellows have become the brand of the African Leadership Center, and they brand because in very many locations of the continent or any other part of the world, but mostly on the continent of Africa that we go to, we can begin to easily distinguish our fellows by the quality of debate that they get engaged in. And those core values that we imbibe in them become evident almost immediately. What are they? Then the pursuit of excellence, which you say yes, everybody would have that, but that is equality. And you can see that through the performance on our, on our programs at King's College in London here. But secondly, African-led ideas of change. Thirdly, independent thinking. Our fellows are likely to challenge you on almost uh, every established framework that you get. You put in front of them or ideas that you put in front of them. 
But I think in addition to that, respect for diversity in all its forms. And I see that uh, in all its forms. But also respect for new agency. The continent that somehow has, if you like, the only continent at the moment that is undergoing the youth bunch is Africa. And in a sense, it's the only continent where you do not readily see youth views and youth ideas in mainstream. You would have to go to the periphery of the state, of discourses or agendas to begin to find new voices. So that we have a, a lot of respect, solid respect for youth agency. And you look at our friends, you'll be able to see that as well. Finally, integrity, which is that core value that we're introducing to not just leadership ideas, but our, our, our project of transformative uh, change in Africa. That is the brand that our fellows at the African Leadership Center speak to. But in that brand, you see diversity in all its forms. We have trained uh, in the last 10 years, as of this year, about 90 fellows in this program. They come from 20 African countries. You see a gender balance. Actually, you probably find more women on our programs in total uh, than men. But you see all of that. Class is the one thing that stands out. Almost any elite institution like Kings that you go to and point to an African student, 50% of the time will be children of elite, those who can afford it, those who think that they have you know, a right to walk through those corridors of prestigious institutions. But the best of the best compete for our fellowship programs in Africa. And when they come to Kings, you can truly look at them. And I, I, I think I have to go back to the record. I don't know how many children of elite we have. Maybe we have one or two amongst the 90 because everybody competes poorly. But from across the social classes of the continent, you find our fellows. And that stands us apart. It means that the voices of ordinary Africans can be heard in the corridors of power, whichever way you see for our knowledge that have. So that is about the African Leadership Center and about the Fellowship Center. I want to move to the core business of today, which is the simulation seminar. Why the simulation? And the simulation is very dear to us for a whole range of, of reasons. One, it's a central element and method of training for us. Because once you have to uh, simulate anything, once the moment you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes, in a leader's shoes or in an actor's shoes, it causes you to be, become more reflexive. And that reflexivity begins to offer you a new perspective. We love simulation for that. Because you, you, if, you're, if you're taking the position of a minister, a vice chancellor, a head of state, a civil society actor, uh, you then have to go into their work, into how they reason, how they think. And I think that method of learning itself is very valuable for the kind of work that we do, which focuses on contemporary peace and security uh, issues in Africa and globally, uh, I dare say. But, but secondly, we're dealing with the subject of peace and security uh, in a continent like Africa, where at least three quarters of the states uh, on the continent are really, in, things are in flux, and you cannot really say that uh, we have democratic consolidation. So expressing your views will come at a cost. And more often than not, they come at a cost. So the kind of analysis we offer here, which tends to be uh, very robust, uh, which speaks to very serious issues uh, and in real time, means that if you have fellows who are citizens of their various countries and will be returning to those countries, by the way, the return rate on our fellowship program to Africa is 100%. That speaks to the quality of fellows that we bring. They want to go home and make a difference. So therefore, we select you know, the issues, they're topical, but methodologically we think that simulation is a good way of speaking truth to power. So the people that you'll see on the panel uh, may not be, and are rarely citizens of the countries that are affected by the, you know, by that are on the agenda that we discuss, but they speak freely in their capacity, in, in the roles that uh, they're playing at that point in time. But that allows us to really get uh, to the bottom of the issues that we're discussing. And that's what you're going to have today. 
Today we have two panels, but before I tell you who's on the panel, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Desmond Davis. Where is Desmond? Uh, Desmond Davis is one of the mentors at the African Leadership Center. He has more than 40 years experience as a journalist. But when you see him interact with our fellows, the mentoring aspect of our fellowship program is in parallels parallel to the academic program. And it's compulsory. It is what everyone does. But our mentors come from different walks of life, from the United Nations, from academia. I see that Simon Monday is here, who would normally actually be the one to take our fellows through our European program, the visits to Parliament, to European Parliament uh, as well. Uh, and so the media aspect of our work, we also take seriously. You can have brilliant ideas, but communicating those ideas is also very, very important. It's not just that we're trying to, to bring to the fore uh, visionary leaders, but making meaning, you know, articulating a vision, making meaning uh, in a way that you can communicate that vision. Uh, and being able to translate it effectively is crucial. So Desmond, Munira, I want to acknowledge uh, Munira Chai, who was with the BBC uh, for more than 20 years, uh, World Service. Uh, these mentors help us shape the communication strategies of our fellows. So today you will have Desmond Davis chairing these sessions for which he has prepared uh, our fellows over a couple of months. Uh, Desmond, please take your place as the chair for today. Thank you very much. Please welcome. Thank you. And so I would then want to introduce the first panel. And this first panel, as you have on the uh, short scripts with you, uh, is the panel that looks at Ebola in West Africa, failures of post conflict reconstruction in Africa. And of course, for those who have been following Ebola, you do know uh, the countries that are the most affected by this in Africa. And so it will be no surprise to you that I will want to welcome uh, the President of Liberia, uh, Honorable, or oh, High Excellency, I should say, I'm so sorry, Ellen Johnson Sally. <laughs> Yeah? So put them under pressure as though they were in those roles. 
and I assure you they have been trained to respond you know, appropriately. I dare say cleverly as well, but we want them to speak to truth in power. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the chaotic uh, response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa 15 months ago uh, clearly highlighted a woeful uh, feeling of parts of the government of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. It also demonstrated how poor uh, communication uh, leads to crisis in Africa. So today, to discuss the story issue, we have Dr. Alan Johnson, seventh of Nigeria, President Ernest Loma from Sierra Leone, the Governor of Lagos State, uh, Fashola, and uh, the President of the ECOWAS Commission, Kedri Odwara. We will start with opening statements that will be there, President Johnson himself. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. His Excellency, the President of Sierra Leone, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to participate in this panel today, a panel that addresses the fate of West Africa in the face of the deadly Ebola virus disease. As you may all know, Liberia became the hardest hit state following the outbreak of Ebola in March 2014. In recent weeks, however, our commitment, our dedication, our leadership, our efforts have finally gotten us on the path of progress. I would like to use this platform to reiterate that Liberians and the government of Liberia are confident that within 60 days, Liberia will be in I also express our deepest gratitude to all our partners, ECOWAS, African Union, the U.S., WHO, who have worked with us as we strive to contain this virus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. 
themselves in the front line of this fight and also uh, express appreciation to the international community, the world government, and uh, private partners who have been providing assistance throughout this process. Uh, as we all know, uh, Ebola is not just a problem of Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, that of West Africa or Africa, but it's a global security issue that requires a global coordinated response. <coughs> As a regional body, uh, we continue to emphasize that our member states refrain from uh, closing their borders and provide no solution uh, to the Ebola epidemic. Uh, we, uh, we urge our member states to refrain also from uh, condemnation and stigmatization, and uh, we urge our member states rather to work together in solidarity as the spirit of oneness and solidarity is the essence of ECOWAS. We should not allow uh, ourselves to lose the foundation of our community. But ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to ask questions and say who you are and who you are. President Papa, why did it take you so long to provide time and accurate information to people who share with you? One of the one of the public occurred in Guinea in December 2013. Ebola was a crisis that we had not experienced before the region. We were working tirelessly with the WHO to advise how we can respond to this complex in evolving cases. But we're now focusing on how we can eliminate this virus. We're mobilizing our resources and energies towards making sure that we completely eliminate this virus. The what took so long does, is it because the outbreak occurred in Canada, where uh, is the, 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 the hotbed of opposition to, to the government? Is the hotbed is the, uh, the stronghold of the Sierra Leone was part of The government just didn't bother because it was occurring in the, in the, the, the seat of the opposition party. There are elements who are trying to take advantage of this uh, situation to score political points. But this is very canvas of them and we must resist these efforts. Mm -hmm. We remain committed to ensuring that uh, our efforts go towards President Johnson said, the reason why Liberia failed to react uh, to, to the government's uh, message about uh, how to deal with Ebola was just down to basically to the lawless nature of Liberia, isn't it? You call it lawlessness, we call it political confusion. Uh, Liberia has been in crisis for more than 15 years. As you know, Liberia is a country that cares for its people. Ebola itself presented certain similarities with some of the diseases that we have in Liberia, whether it's malaria or lesser fever. It was confusing. We were overwhelmed. But the moment we were able to find our path, we embarked on a progress which we are confident is going to continue. And I'm sure that you can see by our results today, Liberia went from recording 100 cases per day in October 2014 to just a mere five cases per week in February 2015. Thank you. If you want to ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Margaret Bonogoma from the West African Civil Society Forum. My questions are for the presidents of Liberia and Sierra Leone. In particular, Madam President, I, I watched CNN uh, during your recent uh, parliamentary elections, and one of your citizens said it was a greed of the leaders that made them still conduct elections, even during the border. Why did you not consider, you know, why were you people in a hurry to conduct elections to retain yourselves, you know, your parliamentarians in power? Was it not possible to just postpone those elections? Thank you. To be able to get full participation from your citizens. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I also have a question for the okay. President. Okay. President Koroma, you are waxing here okay, about what you have done in response to the But as at early February, information coming to us at the 3rd of February tells us that while Sierra Leone, while Liberia had gotten their weekly uh, infection rates from Ebola down to 3 and Guinea down to 30, Sierra Leone was recording 65. What accounts for that? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you for that question. 
Allow me to say that Liberia is a democratic state. In other words, we believe in elections. While we were busy conducting our parliamentary elections, we had a task force which had been set in place to deal with Ebola. I wouldn't call it greed, but I would like to believe that the Liberian government did not communicate effectively with its people from the outset of Ebola. And we acknowledge that. However, we are confident that we will be able to regain the trust of our people and that we will defeat Ebola. Thank you. Well, we recognize the gaps that we have in fighting this disease, but we have built the necessary capacity to fight this disease. We have more than 10 treatment centers, more than 30 laboratory uh, centers, more than a thousand health workers and contact tracers to fight this disease. We remain hopeful that within the next few months we completely eliminate this disease. Well, the fashion of how the uh, Lagos managed to counter the threat of Ebola given its huge population and the complex nature of the health service in the Lagos state itself? I mean, there are a number of very clear steps that we put in place to ensure that this, this risk was, was attended to. We were prepared. Uh, we used the backbone of our polio surveillance system to do extensive contact tracing. We trained um, over 1,800 health workers, which were deployed across, across the state. And we had very effective communication strategy in place. I made it my personal business to visit isolation wards to speak with Ebola victims. And these form uh, the core part of our, of our approach to, to addressing the crisis. President, well, uh, ECOWAS is a very long system of failed unions. And we have to be a but it also, it's also a security issue now, it's a turn of people. Yes, it's a security issue, and we, see, we will not say that the early uh, warning system failed. What we will say is that the early warning system is not an exhaustive system in itself. It represents a useful framework that has helped us uh, uh, in, this, in this process. And, uh, but, uh, and we were able to you know, uh, identify uh, the, the scourge, and by March 2014, just a month after, we are really seeing our, our health workers. To the West African organization. Yes. Um, hi, good morning. My name is Ifis Matthew from Haywa Africa Basin Sierra Leone. My question is directed to the President of Sierra Leone and Justin Green. My office received a letter dated on the 5th of November about the Kerry Town Centre. You know the Ebola Center in Sierra Leone, and it was signed by the defeat president in Sierra Leone. The picture is that they're actually helping. I don't know if this whole Ebola thing is an opportunity for people like you to siphon fronts and the Western government to show the world that they're trying to help Africa. When the actual fact, they're not doing something like that. The letter stated that the facility, the AT bed facility, which on the news they've been telling us is for treatment of Ebola, but in the actual fact, it is for the treatment of all HMG personnel, national healthcare workers, or clinical staff of experts, not actually, and for British people in Sierra Leone, not for Sierra Leone. So, I mean, I was listening to you to see if you can allude to that point, to say you're having certain difficulties, but you kind of shielded this reality when I have the evidence attached in, here. So, what do you have to say for yourself? In, 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 the same in, question is directed to Green. Yes, well. in, Thank in, you. President Karuma, the, the, the Ebola audit has shown that. Uh, uh, Four million uh, pounds disappeared from the 12 million the government gave to uh, 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 So, what has happened to 4 million pounds? There are elements, these are callous elements, who are trying to take advantage of this situation for personal gain. My government has instructed government agencies, the civil society organization, the NGOs, to take an audit, a thorough audit of this process and to account for all the funds that we have received to fight this disease. But would you agree that this is not just a mere corruption, this is a crime against humanity and those funds do think should spend the rest of their lives in jail? My agenda for prosperity has a very clear pillar for fighting, anti -corru uh, for fighting corruption. But the government does not have a good reputation to fight corruption. 
We remain committed to fighting this corruption. We have, for instance, last year had 100% conviction rates of all those corruption cases. This is not official. We remain committed to fighting corruption within our government and we are mobilizing all resources to make sure that all these funds that we receive go towards meeting the needs. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and the moderator, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen. I represent the UK government, and as the moderator, we have uh, made the commitment to help fight the Ebola crisis in West Africa. We have um, uh, given, in terms of aid, over an excess of 325 million pounds to be able to set up emergency centers, to be able to help with the vaccines, to be able to train and um, help workers there. We have dispatched our own national health services workers to go to West Africa and especially to Sierra Leone to help contain and manage the disease. So we reiterate that our commitment as the UK government is to help um, West Africa and especially uh, with regards to the Ebola uh, disease for it to be contained. Thank you. What the Ebola been need for this? So are there nurses and doctors not here working for the NHS? We again we reiterate that our commitment was to uh, is and was and is to help uh, West Africa to be able to contain and manage the disease, and that's why we have spent nearly over 10 million pounds to train 4,000 uh, health workers in Sierra Leone, especially and West Africa, to be able to help this uh, government uh, maintain what, this. What do you come and work for the NHS? Right. They will not leave here and come work for the NHS. No, the, the, the ones that we are training, the health workers that the, that the aid that we have given have been training are West Africans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. My name is Chiri uh, Timothy uh, from Akshine Lager, representing civil society in, in, in West Africa. Mr. President, it's very shame. You, you, you're sitting in front of us and pretending you're doing very well. If you remember, it took you five weeks to say anything publicly, and then 10 weeks to visit the epicenter, and then 15 weeks to declare emergency. Do you, do you really recognize that your, your action really was, was really slow? And then, Madam President, Ebola is not a new problem in Africa. It has happened in Uganda and former Zaire. Do you really have proper institution, health strategy? Do you even care? to share the best practice from Uganda and other states. Thank you. We were working hard to understand the complexity of this disease. We were not alone in this fight. We had the international community, especially the WHO, which, were, which was advising us. We are now looking forward. We are focusing our efforts, energies, and resources making sure that we fight this disease completely. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, indeed, Ebola is not a new challenge in Africa. I think the first case was reported in 1936. But you must acknowledge or you must take into account the fact that there are different dynamics. The Ebola that we witnessed in Uganda or in DRC from the one that we see in West Africa. The Ebola in East Africa was short and many remain in rural areas. What we see in West Africa is a type of Ebola which is not only long, but which has expanded onto urban areas. This means that we definitely need new strategies and new strategies require a lot of efforts. We may not be where we would have wanted to be in regards to our health system, but we are committed to reinforcing, to strengthening the resilience of the library health system so that we are able in the future not only to address Ebola or even any kind of disease. Um, allow me to say that currently the library government is working with one of the best practitioners Professor Palmer from Harvard University, who 
who was able to turn around and have the, the Rwandan health system. We are also working with the Clinton Initiative, which involves the training of medical doctors, operating of facilities, <coughs> doing everything that we can to make sure that post Ebola, we are even stronger. Thank you. Uh, first, this clearly illustrates the dependence of the African countries. Ebola was discovered in, in Africa in 1976, and African governments are expecting uh, the rest of the world to do something that is unique to the continent. Uh, between 1975 and 2000, only uh, 13 drugs that are related to disease of poverty were developed, only 1% of global drug production. Why can't ECOWAS and the African Union set up a uh, serious uh, uh, disease control prevention center that can give you diseases that are unique to the continent? Thank you very much uh, for your question. Uh, what I must uh, state uh, first is uh, to remove the assumption that uh, Ebola is just an African problem. This was issue there has been left since 1976. It became global because it, it uh, developed in urban areas. Yes, it developed in urban areas. And when it struck, we did not come out to respond. We had to take our time to understand between the two. But it was in 1976. Yes, it has been on the but it was new in these areas, and we must acknowledge that fact. And that is why we are taking a frantic efforts with our uh, health organization uh, committed to West Africa to ensure that uh, uh, such uh, diseases are uh, uh, well prepared for such diseases in the future. And part of our roadmap plan is to ensure that we increase the capacity of our health systems across the region, particularly at the local level. Yes, thank you very much. I think that the Jordan is the director of the African University of Africa. And my questions are for the presidents of, uh, of Liberia and, um, and Syria. Um, Madam President of Liberia, let me first of all admire your ex here. I think it's, it's, it's really quite, quite presidential. But to what extent would you say the activities of your children, especially your son, Fumba, to what extent has it affected your fight um, against the border in your country? Uh, because of course we all know it's, it's no longer a confidential gossip that uh, that your sons have been involved in quite a, lot of, a number of shady deals in, in Liberia. So to what extent has this affected your fight against the border? And the president of Syria alone, um, let me say that repeating the same answer to different questions does not actually make the fact that there are serious problems of corruption in your government. And to what extent has this been a factor in your war against, against the border? And to Governor Raji Fashola, congratulations for what you have done in fighting the border in, in Lagos. But to what extent, again, would you say this has, been, this has been used to cover the fraud in your government, especially the ways you have been alleged to be involved in shady deals with your predecessor? <coughs> Yes, I have got no other well, I've been sitting here. Thanks, sir. President Johnson. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Mr. Chair, I wanted to say that it's going to be about Ebola. It's not about Ebola now. I would therefore, therefore like to ask you, ask the audience to please keep questions. All questions will be, must be related to Ebola and not my family matters. Thank you. No, no. The question is the extent to which the involvement of your children in shady deals, from back to the precise. Has, has been a factor. Please, please, please. Like I, I, I do not see that question related to Ebola. Um, I think that would be a polite way of the question. Thanks, Excellency. <laughs> 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 the fight against corruption remains a key pillar of the government's agenda. We have a very thorough anti corruption strategy. We're dealing and uh, building resilience in our courtrooms. You are standing like a black about all the courts. Repeat the same answer to the same to the different questions. Fight for action remains very fundamental to the fight. As you mentioned, Director, these are allegations. My track record speaks for itself. I was re elected because the, the citizens of Lagos State felt I was providing a dividend as part of my administration. 
true terms has been about strengthening state institutions. Yes, my, my, my record is clear. Um, the budget I submitted as part of my in November is very clear in terms of where the focus of my administration is. Mm -hmm. The focus has been on providing public goods for the citizens of Lagos. And I'm confident that whoever they elect in the next elections will be someone they have confidence will continue to do that work. Thank you. Thank you so much. I admitted earlier that um, the that the, the, the strain that took place in, of Ebola that took place in Uganda is different because it was concentrated in the rural areas. Do you want to explain to us further that there are different types of Ebola which are geographically only concentrated as opposed to in terms of what we are finding from uh, epidemiological studies which are going on? Is that the position of your Ministry of Health or is that your excuse to uh, lack of putting proper measures to contain this disease. And also to President uh, uh, of Sierra Leone, uh, you have been committed, as you say, to fighting this disease, but you've been traveling to European countries for help. Surely, if you were committed, you would have put up the best treatment centers in Sierra Leone. Allow me to say that I'm not an expert on Ebola. But what I do know is the type of Ebola we are dealing with in Liberia. And that type of Ebola has expanded to urban areas. The Liberian government has, however, taken measures to ensure that Ebola is defeated within 60 days because we care about our people. I hope that answers your question. Indeed, uh, President Trump. In four years of independence, no government, military or otherwise, has built a major referral hospital in Sierra Leone. The only major referral hospital in Sierra Leone was built by the British in 1912. Mm -hmm. And John Parks and the ABC have been in power 32 years after the uh, three, four years of independence. This is a disgrace. It's disgraceful, Mr. President. We recognize the health challenges that our country faces, and my government. As you keep recognizing all the challenges. What are you doing about it? My, my, my government's agenda for prosperity <laughs> is a clear <laughs> health pillar that, support, that aims to support the rebuilding of our country's health sector. We have, for instance, a, health, a free health care initiative. We have a free antenatal care uh, initiative. We have recorded, and last year we recorded a, a reduction in Rates. When that when did you go to that hospital for, for treatment? Do I remember the treatment for the family? When Ebola struck. Uh, after Ebola. When Ebola struck, there were, uh, we, we recorded uh, uh, a number of uh, challenges in our health sector, but we, we have a very clear uh, post Ebola recovery plan. Mr. President, when last did you remember the family visit any hospital in Syria? We go abroad for treatment. Exactly, exactly. I don't think he did not have it. Our post Ebola recovery plan aims to rebuild our health sector. This means fundamental to ensuring that we meet our people's needs. Yes. Speaking of my beer, talking about the many committed to fighting corruption, it does seem to me that the only thing he's actually committed to is the delusion or silentness in this matter. Uh, that they, they simply is not happening. However, I would ask a, a, a serious question about the spread of Ebola, and that is, to what extent, and this is to everyone as well, to what extent do you think that cultural factors have been uh, at, at the root of the spread of the disease, as well as the dysfunctional state, as well as the failure of post-conflict reconstruction in these countries? Um, clearly, you have non-functioning infrastructure, but at the same time, the, 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 the lack of cultural engagement has, in many cases, meant that the disease has spread faster into communities where, frankly, it should never, would never have done 20 years ago. Um, thank you for that question. I'm not sure if earlier I mentioned anything about corruption. I think that was about the excellency of the Corona. But again, the Liberian government is also committed to fighting corruption. Um, regarding your question about culture, cultural aspects, Indeed, that was a very huge challenge for, for Liberia. As you know, Liberia is indeed a very cultural um, country, if I can put it that way. 
when Ebola struck in Liberia, the fact that the Liberian government in itself was overwhelmed led people to think that it wasn't Ebola, but that it was a matter of witchcraft. People even thought that it was a conspiracy by the government. We acknowledge the fact that there has been a poor response from the government in terms of spreading the knowledge. But again, it was because we were overwhelmed. We didn't know what we were dealing with. The moment we were able to find our way, the moment we were able to, to embark on a certain path, to, to, to take the right measures, we've, we've noted a lot of progress, as you can see, and we are confident, once again, that come 60 days from today, Liberia will be declared in one free. Yes, in terms of corruption, the EU gave them $60 million for health service and over a two-year period, only $3.9 million was disbursed to the of health. What happened with $60 million? You know, <coughs> the Liberian government is also investigating this, this matter because we've, we've noticed that there were accounting issues. We are still dealing with this and we are we will, we will come out when, when we've done, when we sorted out the, the accounting um, issues regarding this amount of money. But again, the Liberian government is committed to the fight against corruption, and we, we will see, we will come with the results, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Uh, okay. my, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Edelson, I'm an epidemiologist for the World Health Organization, and I have two questions. First one to uh, President Johnson Sirleaf, and the second one to uh, Governor Fashola. Madam President, um, first of all, let me salute your efforts and your aspiration to declare the country Ebola free in 60 days. However, if you remember the beginning of the outbreak in March, it started going up and then it went down quite dramatically in July. Um, and everyone sort of rested and was complacent. What came afterwards was of proportions that no one could have expected. I share your enthusiasm looking at the figures going down. Um, however, in the last few weeks, they've started going up again. I spoke to um, one of my colleagues, the, the district medical officer in Lofa County, earlier this week, and as far as he's concerned, Ebola is already a thing of the past. They've moved on. I'm really concerned about complacency. You know, your, your, your health workers, your staff at local level is, is tired they're exhausted, they will not be able to take another surge of the outbreak. Um, and the, the, the threat is not over as much as you would like it to be. What are you doing to, to ensure that vigilance remains and that people are ready to, to face new cases? Um, Governor Fischel, a question for you. I think you, you described very well the preparedness and the efforts um, that were in place in Lagos to, to contain the outbreak. However, I think the fact that Ebola didn't spread in Nigeria was mainly due to luck. What do you think would have happened if the person introducing Ebola to Nigeria wasn't a VIP, if there wasn't an ECOWAS delegation waiting for him at the airport, and instead of being shipped to one of the best private hospitals in Lagos, he would have gone to a public hospital? Thank you. Thank you. There has been a rise. That is not correct. According to the WHO and our own statistics, Ebola hasn't recorded, uh, Liberia hasn't recorded more than six cases in the past few weeks. I was, I was talking about the three countries combined. I was talking about the three countries combined. Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm talking about Liberia because I'm the Liberia president. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I acknowledge your concern regarding um, the post-Ebola phase. And that is indeed one of the things that we deal with. It's not just a matter of eradicating Ebola. It's also a matter of ensuring that it doesn't come back. And the Liberian <coughs> government is committed to meeting all standards required to ensure that we have a resilient health system. For instance, Liberia commits 19% of its GDP towards the health system. In 2011, Liberia was on the second, um, was ranked second on top of the list of the WHO regarding um, the different countries meeting this deadline. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we are also working with the Clinton Initiative, which we had started even before Ebola. This is just to tell you that although Liberia, the Liberian health system may not be where we would have wanted it to be, we are committed. You may have political will, you may have financial um, resources, but it doesn't happen overnight. And we are confident that within 60 days, and also after the 60 days, the deadline, Liberia will be stronger to deal with any kind of health issue. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I think there are two elements to it. One is whether, what to speculate as to whether uh, we would have had that same outcome if the, out if the first incident had happened elsewhere. Um, as part of my personal initiative and those of other governors across Southwest uh, Nigeria, we had provided a coordination me mechanism to ensure that there were um, measures in place in case the spread uh, came out of legal state. Um, Yes, this, this happened in a particular context, but as I've explained earlier, there were measures, preparedness measures in place previous uh, to the out this particular outbreak that would have ensured that the response would have been similar. So I don't want to speculate anymore, but just to note that, as I've emphasized earlier, there was preparedness in place. Yes. Um, my name is Toyin Nigel. I was there to my question is to, to the, the, the president of Nigeria, Mr. Patrick Soya. Your government sent Patrick Soya to Lagos or to Nigeria, knowing that he was he was he had been uh, infected, uh, he had been exposed to the virus, but your government still sent him. You, you your government cleared him to. to for the echo was hitting. So, do you have an incompetent government? Nine, eight people died in, um, in Nigeria. Um, among them, a leading doctor. So, uh, is your government, is your government how, how did that happen under your, and yet you're saying that you're in charge and things were, you're doing everything. We're very concerned as Lagos residents. Thank you. Um, Patrick Sawyer, as you've mentioned, is, is one of those that the Liberian government has tried to deal with, although it was in a way that we really But the Liberian government itself condemned the actions of Patrick Sawyer. And we, we, we acknowledge the fact that he is, he is Liberian, but we would never take risk to ensure or to to, to, to put our neighbors at risk. We will never take any actions that we put our neighbors at risk. So we did condemn the actions and, and I acknowledge your concern about that. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, this addressing this word committed, I'm committed to using weight, but it doesn't mean it happens. Uh, this is true of what's really the president's too. Uh, I have a question to Justine Greening, uh, speaking as a representative of Save the Children. Wouldn't you say, as usual, the famous international community acted too little, too late, with, and in an uncoordinated way, which actually shames multinational organisations? Uh, 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 we should have been acting far sooner, far more responsibly, and not as individual countries, as a coordinated system right across the West. We acknowledge that uh, some of the health, and especially from the UK government, uh, came up with too little, but most of the cases of Ebola have already been recorded in West Africa. But we have also acknowledged that these West African countries are democratic, they are, they are their own states in their own right. So we, we were um, sort of expecting that they would be the ones to ask us for help because we cannot intervene in a country that is already uh, democratic, is already a, a state on its own. But the moment we got the, the call, we were able, like the UK government, uh, we were able to dispatch nearly 325 million pounds, set up emergency centers, work with Save the Children, um, work with WHO, <coughs> work with the UN to be able to contain and eliminate the disease. Thank you. I don't think I'll answer my question about <laughs> coordination of multinational organizations. But you've heard about how uh, the funds have disappeared in Syria. 
how can we justify the British taxpayer to the coalition insistence on having not on 7% of GDP going towards aid when you have all these uh, reckless government putting away money, aid money? Mm. We do acknowledge that that has been a discussion even in our own parliament here about the accountability processes that have been there with the loss of nearly 56 million pounds. And uh, we remain committed as well to, be, to making sure that this accountability, even with the bilateral partners in West Africa, are met. And we expect that this, uh, the relationships that we have with the government will be able to uh, work together to coordinate so that some of this corruption cases can be spent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, President Coleman, I don't think you are taking the question very seriously. If you remember, uh, you, you were invited to attend an international conference in London, and then you said you are not appropriate funds to attend. And then later, you went to Norway to attend your daughter's graduation with your wife. Why is that? And then, Madam President, the, the, the response from the international community was, was very slow. Do you really feel that the people of Liberia have been let down by the, the international community? Yes, I mean, because if you want your daughter's graduation, you got a check provided by the mining company. Yes, yes, that was good. Yes. My main responsibility as the head of state remains to serve my people. And how could how you say? This trip was a sponsored trip, but I took. By the mining company, uh, the finish. This was a sponsored trip, but. Alongside this trip was a very important meeting that I had to attend. So I took advantage of this uh, meeting, of this concert trip, to visit my, my daughter. So I did not use any government resources, but we are, we are mobilizing all government resources to ensure that we fight this disease. And we are, we are committed to ensuring that all our funds, all government resources go towards fighting this disease. President Johnson, sir. Thank you. Um, Allow me to say that the response of the international community might have come late. I was a little bit saddened at the point. But you know, what matters is the present. Currently, Liberia is on the path of progress. And we are confident not only that the international community will still continue to support us as we start to contain this virus, but that the result that we've achieved recently is a combination of not only the librarians, librarian government, but also the international community. So let's not down on the past anymore, but focus on the present and the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. We keep concentrating on the world. There are 24,000 cases now malaria in Africa. What is the regional organization doing? You know, what is the AU doing to try to resolve uh, this serious problem in malaria in Africa? Um, we are coordinating efforts with the African Union and also with uh, the general government of the African continent. And uh, the, after the, uh, part of our roadmap plan is to ensure that we build the capacities of uh, health uh, uh, structures across the region, particularly in the African Okay, uh, we've got time to ask the president of Liberia to give a closing statement.
President Trump, the last few months the country has been on trial. We've been facing a very dangerous enemy, but through my government's efforts, the dedication of our <coughs> people and the coordination of the international community, we are making progress in fighting this disease. I salute the people of Sierra Leone. I salute our health workers. I salute our burial teams. I salute our contact tracers. We remain grateful to the international community for the support in these trying times. We are now focusing our energies and resources to ensure that we completely eliminate this disease. This disease is not a Sardinian disease. This disease is not a West African disease. This is a global concern. This is a global problem. Stigmatizing Sardinians will not solve this problem. We are now focusing on rebuilding more resilient health centers, more resilient uh, health facilities that can fight this disease and other uh, diseases. We remain committed as a government to ensuring that our people and do not have to face this. That the first of which this March will have completely eliminated this disease from Sierra Leone. Thank you very much.